Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining our webinar, The New Work Paradigm Considerations for Organizations Operating in India, presented in partnership between the Legal 500 and Trilegal. Uh, my name is Alan Cohen. I'm a research editor at the Legal 500. And uh, before I hand over the webinar to our impressive panel, I will give a brief introduction of today's topic. As the uh, title suggests, we will discuss what uh, employees need to know about resuming work in this uh, post-pandemic era in India. Uh, we will dive into a number of questions to understand common concerns around returning to the workplace, hybrid work models, um, the, and uh, tackling employee engagement and health issues arising from uh, the new work arrangements. And uh, our speakers will share their insights and provide practical guidance to help you align your uh, corporate strategy with, with the latest transformations in the workplace. Uh, but first, uh, let me introduce uh, Swanima, who will lead us through the discussion today. Uh, Swanima, I don't know if you want to say a quick hello to everybody who so sees who, you, uh, who you are on your screen, on their screen. <clears throat> hi, hi everyone, and, and welcome to the session. Hi. Uh, so Swanima is a, a partner in the employment practice at Trilegal's uh, Bangalore's office. She's worked with domestic and uh, international clients in a variety of employment matters, including uh, structuring employment contracts and policies, handling disciplinary issues, and advising on the uh, effective management of resignations and terminations. Swanima has uh, assisted her clients in formulating work workplace preparedness and resiliency plans during and after the global pandemic. She's also collaborated with NASCOM, which is the, which is the uh, National Association of Software and uh, Service Companies, to release a discussion paper that sets out the uh, challenges faced by companies with multi-state employees in light of varying state labor laws, uh, the issues relating to remote and hybrid working, and the potential solutions to overcome these uh, challenges. Uh, so I'll hand over to you in a moment, Swanima, but uh, before that, I would like to uh, let our audience know that this session is interactive. So if you have any questions at any point during the webinar, please uh, submit them uh, using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and, uh, and we will put them to uh, the panel once the uh, presentation is over. Um, okay, since Wanima, I'm handing this over to you now. Um, feel free to you know, introduce the topic further, uh, introduce the panelists who are joining us, and uh, just lead the conversation. Get us on the way. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Alan, and welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for joining our session today. So well, while Alan did set the context, uh, I'll just talk briefly around how we have structured our conversation today. Um, we have divided into two broad topics. Um, the first one being return to work. I mean, rather, I would say return to offices, physical offices, um, and preparing for the new normal. Right. We we intend to uh, discuss some of the frequently asked questions, something that I'm asked on a daily basis nowadays is, you know, the health and safety issues, vaccination, of course, can it be mandatory? You know, how do we implement that? And the newer forms of disciplinary issues and matters we are we are seeing with remote working and how do we address that? Um, so that's the first part. And the second part of the discussion is where we are going to discuss more about the future of work. Um, is remote working something that's here to stay? Um, are organizations really considering full remote working? And, and of course, there is we can't discuss future of work without discussing the labor courts, which is something we've been hearing about for a while in India, right? So um, the gig workers, freelancers, contract workers, and, and also the four-week day, which we've seen a lot in, in news reports. So we will discuss some of these aspects um, in the second part. Um, as Alan mentioned, we intend to keep this interactive. It's, it's a free-flowing discussion, so please feel free to drop in questions. We do have a Q&A uh, round at the end of our discussion, but we'll, we'll try and bring up the questions during the session as well. So, so without uh, further delay, I mean, let me start the first part and introduce our guests and panelists for the first part of the discussion. Uh, Shreya Hasija from Axon Noble. Um, hi, Shreya. Well, welcome to the session. And hello. 
Thank you so much. And we also have Nidhi Parikh from Citibank. Um, hi, Nidhi. Hi, Charma. Hello, everyone. So just, just a quick round of introduction. Shreya is the Integrity and Compliance Manager. Uh, South Asia Pacific has been associated with Axo Noble since 2015. Uh, she joined Axo Noble as a legal counsel where she was involved in regional commercial issues and has handled various claims and litigation, including, of course, legacy employment matters. Um, and given her role, she has been at the forefront of the various challenges on bringing employees back to the workforce, uh, workplace, um, you know, implementation of the various health and safety measures and transition from the pandemic to the post-pandemic era. Uh, Nidhi, on the other hand, I mean, Nidhi is, is a director at Citibank Singapore. Um, she, again, has been with the city uh, group since 2015. Um, Nidhi took up a challenging role. She took up the site head role for the global legal office in Mumbai. And that role started just at the onset of the pandemic. So that's where uh, she's had on ground complete uh, exposure to, I mean, dealing with the lockdowns and the slow opening up of the offices, getting people back, vaccination drives, the second wave, which we all remember how how dreadful it it had been. Um, so, so with that, we we intend to have an interesting round of discussions with uh, both Shreya and Nithi, bringing in some interesting perspective on on these issues, right now. Now, before we get into this and, and I, I, we get into our discussion, we have, um, you know, I want to run a poll and get your thoughts as, as audience on, on the question that is one of the, I think, the most commonly discussed issue. And if we could run the first poll here. Yes, I'm going to pull up. Right. So you, you'll have the poll on in front of your screen. Um, the question is, what has been the biggest challenge in bringing employees back to the workplace? Um, options, uh, no considerable challenge. Employees are eager to return to work. Um, employees prefer to work remotely as they have relocated to their home base or other cities. Employees prefer coming to the workplace, but only for a few days and want to retain the convenience of working from home. And, and this could be just not having to commute. Uh, the reasons could, could be that, or it could be your personal commitments, but, but are more open to a hybrid working arrangement rather than, than a full office work. And the last is employees have raised health and safety issues. Um, so all of you can, can choose uh, what, is closest to you, what you believe is, is most true for your organization. Uh, we'll give it a couple of minutes and, and then we can see the poll results. It's got a few people that are participating us looking pretty nice. Uh, right. So I imagine we'll give a few more uh, seconds. Sorry, Sorry, do you want to give it a few more seconds? Or should we end the poll? Now? Yeah, I think, I think we can end the poll. Okay, so just a couple more seconds and then I'll end it. Okay. Okay, it seems like... No no considerable challenges has got the 0% vote. Uh, so everybody is, is definitely facing issues in, in this area. Um, and there is a close tie between people who have uh, relocated to their home base and other cities and uh, people who prefer coming only a few days a week. Now, now with this, I think uh, I would want to hear from you, Shreya, Nidhi, um, what have your experiences been? And, and Shreya, maybe we can start with you. You know, AXO being um, a company where you have both, um, you know, manufacturing units and offices, 
right? And and the requirements, of course, are very different. The solutions are very different. Uh, what is the current model that you all are looking to? How did you manage to implement some of these? What are what was your challenges and and hopefully solutions for us to hear? So, uh, Swarnima, as a company, I think what really worked for us is that we tried to remain we try to be very flexible in our approach. Uh, that was the base, I would say. Uh, we actually now also have a official hybrid policy in place, which of course means that we understand that uh, people now are used to working in a certain way and we you know, do not want to go back to a full uh, work from office mode. Of course, you know, uh, it depends on the role, et cetera. Uh, but generally, we, we do give a lot of flexibility. We have a hybrid policy in place where, of course, you know, one can work from home a few days and then come to office a few days. Uh, the underlying principle being one that you're role should allow you to work from home the roles should be such in that manner and of course your manager needs to be aligned with with uh, what you choose to do uh, again as you said we are a manufacturing company as well so the wo workforce in factories of course uh, needs to be there for the for the production to happen so due to their very nature of work uh, 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 they were called to to the sites to the to the factories. Uh, however, all COVID protocols were followed, and uh, uh, you know even shifts were created for the factory workers and rosters were created for the office workers, and that's how uh, we've been managing. That's the approach we've taken as a company. Sure, thanks, thanks for that, Shreya and and Nidhi. How have you all gone about it? Almost similar lines because uh, we also are a financial institution and the way we need to operate again gets guided a lot by our regulators in different jurisdictions. In fact, there are certain roles which have to be resident roles in the sense that they can be performed only from site. So we, I would say this has been an evolving space since the time of the lockdown and a part of it, yes, there was a part of the population which was still coming to office with all the COVID protocols in place. Um, there is a part of population who could absolutely work remotely, and there is, yes, a part of population which is hybrid. So at an institution level, I would say that these are the three categories that we are broadly looking at, uh, but everything depends on how the situation is evolving in a particular region, in a particular country, how the developments in terms of what are the regulatory developments and what are the per permissions granted in those countries by the regulators. So I would say in a nutshell, uh, we've been very flexible around this and thanks to the colleagues who have been dealing with the labor laws and with the regulators on day in day in basis and overnight things were changing, overnight circulars were coming to really speed up with those circulars and changing the protocols and ensuring that the infrastructure is very supportive for the employees. So I would say I these are all my thoughts as a recipient, uh, more on the side as a person who was really seeing what was happening rather than being a part of the group who's creating these changes. Uh, so I can only thank that group at City who actually was going through all of these circulars on day-to-day -day basis and in implementing some of these policies and protocols. Thanks. And, and what I hear from both of you is it seems there's a classification at some level of roads that are on site, uh, roles that are hybrid and roles that can be done fully remote, um, right? And, and that's been my experience as well with most organizations who've gone about with that classification and then rolled out different policies based on that. Now, here, have you all had challenges on the classification, like employees questioning the classification itself? Um, for example, if you have taken a position as an organization that this is an on-site role, um, an individual coming back and saying, no, I believe this is a hybrid role and therefore I should um, be allowed to work from home on a, on a two-day-a-week or a three-day-a-week basis. And, and how have you all dealt with that? I could go first, Swarnama, on this one, because for us, the approach is really uh, bottoms up. So mm -hmm. a lot of feedback was actually taken by way of surveys from the employees, from the respective teams to say, how do you, you how do you research your role in this institution? Do you think this is an on-site role? Do you think this could be remotely done? Or do you think it's a hybrid role? So I think that saved a lot of energy and effort and that back and forth 
uh, where it could have been a top down and people would have just pushed through their decision on them. So this was more like bottoms up where people were sharing their inputs and really on ground what they felt. And that's how I would say a lot of decision making will come and has come over a period of time in terms of categorizing different roles um, for, for all of us, be it for legal, be it for even other product functions, including on the business side as well. So it was all the feedback was taken from them and accordingly the categorization were done. Right. And and Shreya, what, what has your experience been? So, so firstly, at the outset, I would like to say that uh, we had not seen such a concern or, or uh, any big challenge, to be very honest. But I think the reason for that could be because I think uh, the approach our company took has been very preemptive and flexible in that manner right from the beginning. Because in our policy document itself, we have left the discretion on whether the role can be done remotely or not uh, uh, to the managers itself. You know, we've really decentralized the process in that regard uh, because you know, uh, because the managers can, I think, know best if their direct report can work remotely or not. What are their uh, daily roles? What are what what do they really do on a day to day basis? So, you know, for example, if we say employees in manufacturing units need to be at the site all the time, I'm sure you know there must be a role in which one can work from home at 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 that site as well. Or, for example, not not all sales employees are supposed to be on the field all the time. There are sub functions within the sales organization as well which can work remotely. So I think uh, the idea was to take this flexible approach uh, so that really one ensured that the upper management is not taking decisions uh, with regard to hybrid working uh, that was not aligned with the specific roles. And two, I think we were also empowering the managers uh, a lot uh, by, by taking this approach. So that's how I think we were able to uh, manage any, any concerns, if any, uh, coming up. And so overall, Swarnama, sorry, just to add over here, overall, I think there was a big cultural shift in people mm -hmm. accepting that really work can be done remotely. If things can be done overnight, then yes, the flexible working hours, in fact, it was all actually for city, if you see, uh, we saw an increased productivity and increased number of hours were being logged in by employees. And we were concerned about that. Uh, so we didn't have a problem otherwise where there was a lot of absenteeism. In fact, if there were, that was only because of COVID and therefore we started tracking it to ensure that people were not falling sick and were not being traced. But there was just over overworking and we were more concerned from that and then we had to put in initiatives to ensure that people are being encouraged, even though they cannot travel, but still please take time off. Uh, please do not overwork yourself. It could involve like taking just time off and just sitting in your in your house without having the worry to 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 log in. So I, I think I think that cultural shift was a good change because a few years back or before COVID, if anybody would have said, "Okay, on a Monday I want to work from home," um, you know how the answer would have been. Forget about the corporates, even for law firms. And I, I think it would be good to know how the law firms uh, kind of implemented that cultural change. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I, I know. And it didn't seem difficult at all. It, it was so seamless. It, it worked so well. Uh, in fact, I think I'm much more efficient when I am at home because there are <laughs> lesser distractions around. So, so yes, I think some change and, and that's, that's a positive change. I take that as a positive from the pandemic. But, you know, to circle back to the question and I think a response to the audience to the poll, um, what I'm hearing is both of you have successfully managed to, to roll out a hybrid model without much pushback. And to me, what comes across as the key takeaway has been the bottoms up approach, leaving empowering the people manager, empowering the employees to have that uh, more granular, uh, individual specific discussions on what that role can do and cannot do rather than having a uh, you know, 360 degree high up their policy and says, this is what it is. And, and that to me seems like a solution, which, which is a good takeaway for, for all of us here. Right. Now, now one of the concerns and one, I think about 6% of the poll results also said that there are concerns around health and safety. And I've had that uh, people have come back and said, listen, I have parents, old parents living with me, and or I have young children who, who are, of course, not vaccinated. And therefore, 
I am concerned about coming to the workplace, right? Um, now, with health and safety, we know, and, and Nidhi, you pointed it out, the circulars were coming overnight. I mean, I remember the first few months we used to start the day typing out an advice to the client. And by the time yeah. we were ready to send it, there was another uh, circular that would be there. So we would re rework the health and safety requirements. Um, you know, so, and, and I've had, I mean, there's been thermal screening to the six feet distance to mandatory masks. Uh, it's relaxed a lot now because early this year, a lot of state governments relaxed those requirements, even the six feet distance is to the extent feasible. Uh, but some questions I've had regularly from clients is, how do you enforce mandatory masking? Like today, again, you know, in Karnataka, it's again mandatory. Those cases have been on rise. So uh, these requirements have been reintroduced. Um, and we know the reality on ground, you you walk on the street and you don't see it uh, being enforced as strictly. So how do you, how have you all managed it in your offices? Have you only restricted it to common spaces or, you know, there's a strict requirement around this? And, and also I'm, I would be curious about the social distancing, you know, be it when you're going to the cafeteria or, or other common places, how, how have you all managed um, some of the health and safety requirements. So if I if I may uh, jump in on that one. So, of course, you know, a lot of measures have been adopted by our company as well on health and safety in general. And uh, if I talk about specifically about the implementation of the mandatory physical guidelines or government SOPs that came out, like, you know, six feet distances or ma masking, etc. So I can at least say, in our company, it was followed to the T, uh, you know, in the sense that rosters were created to ensure only certain number of people are in the office at a time. Uh, markings were made, you know, uh, everywhere, not just on the common areas, but, you know, even uh, inside the meeting rooms, you know, the chairs were crossed out. Uh, some of our chairs or, or the open desking system also were crossed out, etc. Regular sanitizations were happening. Sanitizers were available throughout the office. Uh, you know, things like uh, foot pedals on the doors, for example, you know, things like that. And uh, temperature screening at the entrance, checking our rogue setu for contact tracing, etc. And that's something which is happening in our office till date. You know, it's not that um, if you if you step out of your house, you see some relaxation in place, but that hasn't really translated uh, to our to our offices. And uh, to explain this better, actually, I will I will set some context here. Uh, so Axonobel has three core values and one of them is safety and Axonobel is extremely serious about it. Uh, to, to give you an example, uh, COVID, non-COVID, we are not even allowed to talk on the phone if you're walking in the corridor or we can't even look at our phones. Uh, you know, we'll be, we'll be reported against or, or some colleague will immediately come in to, you know, to tell you that, you know, this is, this is wrong, you, you cannot do this and they'll, they'll, they'll instantly correct you. And, uh, you know, so with this example, what I want to really explain is that safety is so ingrained in our system as an Axonobel employee. You know, even if I'm out in the market, if by mistake I'm walking and I look in at my phone, you know, I'll feel instantly guilty and I'll just put back my phone. And so that's the standard Axonobel has set for safety. You know, they do not care for your for your safety only when you're inside the office, but also when you're outside of it. So with this background, when we say or when we spread awareness or when we're training the employees, honestly, it's not very difficult to, uh, to, to tell them, you know, you have to wear masks and you have to follow this physical distancing because we are already very, very strict about a lot of other things around safety. Uh, and also, if I delve a little deeper into this topic and I'll specifically talk about the factories as well. Uh, for factories as well, you know, all of this, uh, what I said earlier, screenings are done at the entrance only people with masks are allowed uh, in our factory specifically we follow uh, this what we call is the behavior based trainings uh, so those are conducted at sites and even behavior based observations or reporting is being done on a daily basis uh, if there's even a very minute non compliance around safety and not just COVID safety, but generally any kind of a safety, if there's even a very small incident, uh, our safety colleagues are have to mandatorily report it in the in the in the global system that we have. So, you know, then we also have this peer-to-peer -peer observations, and then, you know, again, things like markings on where to stand, etc., screening, and you know, all of that. So 
you know, our factory workers, because of the very nature of the risk involved in working in factories, I think I think I can say that they are even more well versed of the safety standards than maybe I am today sitting here as an integrity and compliance manager, because they do go through those trainings on a daily basis. That's that's really interesting. I mean, I didn't even think looking at the phone and walking was a safety concern <laughs> till you mentioned that. So yes, I, I that that gives us the context in, in how seriously <laughs> you're looking at it. Um, I'll just add to it by saying it wasn't very different for us as well because one, um, I think the second wave of COVID. Um, brought a lot of individual awareness and that's when people also started coming in after second wave so between first wave and second wave there wasn't too much of a footfall in office but post second wave when there were a little bit of relaxations and people were coming into office I think that individual consciousness and awareness was so high and people were so scared that um, we didn't have to really like you know impose upon them yes there were enough uh, messaging done uh, whether it's through you know email um, blast emails or it was through cutouts which were kind of put across the meeting rooms common areas washrooms pantry etc so there was a constant reminder to them that they should maintain social distancing there should be masking the lifts the number of people who could enter into the lift at a point point of time was being regulated so there was a person who was actually checking how many people could enter into the lift so i think all of that was there but it all became successful also because of the individual awareness that everybody was following and was very very cautious about um just to bring a little bit of context from a global perspective and because i also transitioned during that phase like as we were I entered into a role in India at the time of lockdown and as the restrictions were being lifted, I handed over that role and moved to a new country. And here when I came into Singapore, um, initially there were self-testing was mandatory before you would enter office. And it so much happened that when one of my colleagues was sharing this story that he entered office uh, thinking now the, you know, the restrictions are relaxed. So he did not conduct the self-test on that day. Uh, you wouldn't believe that the executive assistant actually came running to him and gave him the self test and said, no, conduct the test right now. I'm standing here and upload the result. So it's just, I think there were checks and balances in various formal and informal ways. Uh, people on were like, if you were not, if you were being little careless about it, there was somebody else to, to remind you about it. So I think it, it worked out as a very, very much like a collaborative effort um, where the institution was imbibing that um, that environment that it's required, not as a, it's not a, it's not a something that you like to do, but it's something like a necessity today. So, so yes, that that was our experience, and I also saw like two different um, countries uh, having a different uh, stages of their compliance um, protocol. I would say. Thanks, thanks a lot for that. And, and I think talking about health and safety, uh, the, the biggest and the most talked about issue is vaccinations and mandatory vaccinations and different countries taking different approaches on that. But before we get into that, let's, let's run our poll question, Alan. Um, let's run the polls two and three, maybe starting with the with poll two. So did they... Preparing it, I'm going to launch it now. Right. So, has your organization made it mandatory for employees to be vaccinated as a condition of employment? And what I'm also hearing is as a condition of being hired, right? Um, options are yes, no, thinking about it, no intention to impose a vaccination requirement. And we'll just give it a, a couple of minutes. Yes, absolutely. Letting people enter. <clears throat> people still responding, so maybe a few more seconds. Okay, so I think it's okay now to uh, 
close it if that's okay with you yeah okay ending it now yes we can see the poll results okay so we have 34 percent who are thinking of it as a condition of employment that's that's interesting and i i didn't expect that as that's a high percentage and 45 person saying no um Okay, and, and Alan, before we discuss this, maybe if we could run the, the third poll as well. Absolutely, doing it right now. <clears throat> okay, everybody should see it now. And this is more about entry into the premises. So has your organization made it mandatory for employees to be vaccinated as a condition to entering the workplace? Um, Again, same options, yes, no, thinking about it, and no intention to impose such a requirement. All right, I think we can stop it now, so I'm going to share the results. Yes, this, this is something that I thought as well, uh, a very high number, you know, saying yes, it's mandatory as a condition of entry into the office. Now, you know, the legal uh, position on this has, has been a very interesting one, and, and this has varied across countries. Um, now, in India, the central government guidance is that its vaccination is voluntary, it's not mandatory. Um, but we have time and again seen various state governments come out with circulars um, imposing the obligation on employers to ensure that their employees are vaccinated. Um, there have been rulings uh, in the Meghalaya High Court, the Guwahati High Court, setting aside some of these orders, uh, saying it's unconstitutional because it violates your fundamental right to, uh, you know, fundamental right to life and your body also a fundamental right, right to livelihood. Um, but in many states like, like Maharashtra, Telangana, there were these vaccination orders till, till very recently um, and they were not challenged, right? So they continued to be in force. Um, it's only recently this year, May, we had a Supreme Court ruling on this um, where the Supreme Court said, yes, the government has the ability to come out with reasonable restrictions but it needs to be balanced with and proportionate to the requirement. And given the number of uh, cases now, it's on the downhill. I mean, there, there are lesser cases now and therefore it's not proportionate to impose this. I remember in Bangalore, when we entered shopping malls, we were required to show vaccination certificates and court said, no, you cannot make it mandatory as a condition of use of public resources or a condition to deny right to livelihood, right? Now, what does this mean for private employers? My interpretation of the judgment is that if even if a private employer is coming up with a requirement saying uh, that we would terminate your employment if you're not vaccinated, that could definitely be challenged because of the way the Supreme Court has looked at it. But if it is as a condition of entry into the premises, that is something that we can still justify from a health and safety perspective, provided there is an alternate, like they can work from home, they continue to get their salaries, uh, there is no detriment to that extent. So that's, that's really how, uh, you know, the, the case law on this has evolved. As of now, most state governments have withdrawn the vac mandatory vaccination orders. So those are no longer in place. Um, but I've seen many companies continue to, to make it mandatory as a condition of entry. Um, right now, I'm, I'm interested here in, in Shreya, what has your approach been, you know, in terms of making it mandatory? Have you had a pushback from the employees? Um, right? And, and if yes, how have you dealt with it? So, so to answer your last part first, fortunately, unfortunately, no, we did not face any challenge or pushback uh, here as well. Uh, having said that, we were prepared if such a scenario would have taken place or arised. So 
there could have been easily be a case where someone saying no we don't want to get vaccinated and we were very clear that the approach we'll take you know because again from the government point of view it wasn't mandatory so the approach we took was that we'll be counseling the employee and we were very very clear about that since the beginning you know we'll be counseling the employee in the sense that though it remains his or her decision but uh, uh, their decision to not get vaccinated can put people around them at risk uh, you know so so we were prepared to do something like that or to take that approach but uh, did we come to that uh, no we did not face any such challenges uh, again the approach we took from a vaccination perspective was that uh, it was open for the office going employees to get vaccinated and uh, however for the manufacturing unit employees because you know all of them had to be uh, you know at a physical distance to each other we did mandate to see their vaccination certificates and even uh, at our manufacturing sites we did not receive any pushback through our internal surveys as well actually i'm told that uh, 99% of our uh, workforce is vaccinated uh, though you know what uh, swarnima i think what really helped uh, for axonobel was that we at the at a very very initial stage had tied up with a third party provider to one to conduct company sponsored vaccination drives you know in our at our at our office sites and manufacturing sites there were these vaccination drives that took place uh, and we also with the same service provider with the third party partner we also made it very very easier for employees to find vac vaccination slots at a place of their choice so at that point in time if you remember you know it was very very difficult for for us to get vaccination slots and um, and in my personal opinion i think that could have been the the major um, excuse so as to say of, of not getting vaccinated that you know what i am not getting a slot i can't go through this so as axonobel we really made it very very easy for the employees to get access to it uh, you know either you can come to one of our drives and get it for free or you can get it at a place of your choice and get it reimbursed through the company uh, simultaneously of course you know we also take a generally we take a approach of motivating and encouraging employees to get vaccinated through our awareness campaigns and and training campaigns i think which also really really helps in uh, employees to be more open to get vaccinated uh, however in conclusion we eventually left it open for the employees uh, to get vaccinated in india and uh, you know because i also have original role i can say that this was not the 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 position we took for other countries because some countries had made it mandatory and for us to collect that certain uh, you know set of data where we had to for example in australia singapore i noticed that we had to collect that data whether you're vaccinated or not and then uh, things uh, went from there uh, but but yes again for factory workers mandatory no pushback so i think i need to uh, give like a special mention here to our hr and admin teams for their uh, unrelenting background work that went in this project so so yes that's how we dealt with it thanks thanks shreya and nidhi how how has your experience been i, I think just having a being a part of a global institution you would expect that you cannot have one approach that fits for all so the same thing was was the situation for us in different countries um for example like in us um after the second wave there uh, there were very very stringent measures which were taken to the extent that our ceo went um live to state that yes people will be put to paid early um uh, i think for 30 days on and then also if they don't get vaccinated um, they may get terminated so there were strong messages coming but again i wouldn't say that that trickled down equally to say countries like india because it, a very different approach was taken for india and again it, the, the good part was each senior management of each particular region was communicating the live on ground situation and accordingly the calls were being taken for india yes it was mandatory at least for while entering the office premises uh, you need to be vaccinated or you can say to app or you need to have adequate uh, tests done if if it was like few months back people were also required to conduct tests and carry the results of it before they would enter into office but i think to, as of today if you ask me maybe we don't know the situation is evolving uh, has it been a part of our hiring process as a condition i would really doubt um and even with the supreme court judgment 
I don't think situation would have changed with the judgment, but even before that, I, I really doubt we would have taken that stringent measure uh, for new Heidi, because uh, I think last year, if I'm not mistaken, we were on a hiring spree and just in our so center of service excellence, uh, we have the, the export unit of where we actually like exporting services across uh, jurisdictions. Uh, we hired almost three times the number that we would have hired in 2020. So that wouldn't have been possible if we would have really kept vaccination as a condition. And I don't see a reason for that uh, also because for all legal and practical reasons, I think. Uh, also, we based on the surveys that we conducted for our employee um, population, I think we had a mixed uh, result in the beginning. But that changed substantially after the second wave. So mm -hmm. whilst I don't like to call any silver lining to the second wave, but it was really dreadful. It really scared people very much that even those who thought it's a voluntary thing and thought they would take it at their own ease, I think everybody landed up finally to take the vaccine shots and they would have preferred if it was even allowed for their kids and like elderly people, unless there was any other uh, medical advice given. So I, I think that something, the way the situation evolved over a period of time um, also contributed to the success of vaccination. City itself, uh, like Shreya's organization, we also organized drives for the first dose, for the second dose. And all of this was being reimbursed as part of our global medical insurance plan. Uh, not just that, even the tests that were being conducted, that could have been reimbursed as part of your annual medical checkup. So I think this tie up with the, with the insurance and the third party service providers, plus the continuous engagement at every level with the employees highlighting the importance of vaccination choose the vaccination that you want. Like there was no hard and fast rule about that, but that just highlighting that importance of vaccination and also maybe like there were certain, at times you would have those brainstorming sessions by people who had contracted COVID and recovered very smoothly because of the vaccination. Those stories were being shared uh, publicly with people like, and this could have been through way of, you know, newsletters or blogs which again helped in sensitizing people the importance of vaccination. So I, I would say, we, I really doubt we would have gone to the extent of mandating that as a hiring condition, but definitely for entry into office premises for the larger good that was uh, put as a condition. Thanks, and, and I think that that's been really useful. I think effective communication, making things available, those are my key takeaways. Um, but maybe one thing that you also mentioned as testing being an alternative to vaccination, and, and that's a point I think is, is something I've seen a lot of organizations consider. And here, you know, just for the benefit of our audience, there's also been a Bombay High Court ruling. Uh, which says that organizations can impose testing as an alternative and so much so that you can also pass on the cost of the testing on the employees, um, which I have seen organizations do and that also in a way encourage people to, to get vaccinated. So um, that, that, yeah. that discussion is, is really useful. And, and I'm, I'm just conscious of the time and I have one more question and topic that I want to cover with you all. And there are a flurry of very interesting questions as well. Um, uh, but, you know, what I have seen in the past two years is, is really interesting, innovative disciplinary issues come up. I mean, from moonlighting, uh, where, you know, in the context of remote working, where, uh, and this is with multiple organizations, where an employee is an employee of one organization and holding a job in another organization simultaneously to uh, interview frauds where, uh, and this has happened more than once, uh, where the person who appeared for the job interview is different from the person who finally joined uh, to, of course, uh, you know, the job abandonment, unauthorized absence, or even virtual sexual harassment, right? So we've seen different types of disciplinary issues in the last two years with remote working. Um, your thoughts, have you all uh, experienced any of these? How have you all dealt with it? 
So I, I think my perspective, uh, Swarnima, on this is I think the problem would arise if uh, one would lose engagement with your employees. And that's how or why they would lose focus with the company's overall vision and strategy. So I think uh, our organization, again, you know, uh, taking that preemptive approach or, or proactive approach really did invest a lot in a very structured engagement program. So I, I'll not go into the details of it. I'm conscious of the time, but we had a, a program called Connect Care Capability Culture, where we really worked on, you know, making sure that the leadership team is connecting to the last mile, etc. Forums like Chit Chat Cafe and all of those uh, happened. But, uh, you know, in terms of the major issues that you're stating, as a compliance manager, I think I would say that these issues are more about integrity than anything else, you know, COVID or no COVID. The focus on integrity, doing the right thing every time, each time, even when no one is really watching you. I think I think that's what uh, I talk about as an integrity and compliance manager, and that's, that's what Axel Nobel uh, preaches as well. So at the end of the day, we, you know, as an organization, really leave it to the to the to the employees that you just have to deliver your task as long as the outcome is there. We'll measure the performance basis that. So, in conclusion, no big issues. We we did maintain a strong focus on integrity through and through conducting drives, awareness sessions, our integrity week, etc. So, all of these things have been have been continuing. Uh, the remote working did not stop those initiatives, and I think hence through that pro preemptive approach uh, and employee training awareness, uh, no such disciplinary issues were faced. And wherever there are such integrity issues, we do have you know like a separate confidential whistleblowing uh, channel where such wrongdoings. Uh, if it occurs or is observed is is reported so but but yeah no nothing specific to covid related remote working sure i think again same um likewise i don't think we had moonlighting or like two people doing different roles into different organizations i mean one person doing the different roles and simultaneously into different organizations uh, that way even though we, we hired quite a bit of people during the lockdown i think the processes were not lagged in any manner so the the things which would have not happened maybe through say wet signature or through hard copies were still happening through handwritten notes uh, so i remember like when i moved uh, the roles during that time and when I joined this role um, during the lockdown, I actually submitted a handwritten resignation letter. So it wasn't that you, just because you can't take prints, you you can skip one of the requirements of your offboarding formality. You had to do it. There were just different ways of doing it. Certain things which you had to comply at the time of onboarding into your new role, um, there were proper given like grace periods which were given and it was tagged to your profile so you would get notification time and again to say this is something which is pending it's just a reminder as soon as you're heading back to office you will have to submit it within x number of days so i think the processes which tightened up very much uh, we didn't have issues like this but like any organization yes there were certain disciplinary issues uh, which again were handled in the same way um, like you would have hand, handled them if you were on site. So, um, and I, and then this was, this now sounds a little funny, but I heard other organizations also face this. Um, when slightly the travels opened up, some of the people tried to claim their LTA, the leave travel allowance, uh, mm -hmm. by fake receipts. Now, again, a lot of institutions face that just at the beginning of that restrictions being, were being opened up. And the, those are just not acceptable. So they were dealt with in the way they would have been dealt with even otherwise. So I think COVID didn't change situations, but yes, it just brought into consideration and highlighted certain red flags. And again, the reminders were sent, communications were sent, people were made aware, disciplinary actions were taken around that. Sure. And thank you. Thank you so much. And I know we can continue discussing some of these issues and, and delve deeper. Maybe we can have another round of discussion some, sometime soon. But but I would like to thank both of you for, for your time today. Um, and I think my key take takeaways have been, I think, uh, preemptive approach, communication with the employee, employee engagement, um, uh, uh, bottom up approach. I think all of these have been some of the reasons I would say for, for the success story. So thank you both of you. And uh, with this, I think we can move to our next segment. 
Absolutely. Let's move to the next uh, session. Thank you very much, uh, Nidhi and Trey. It was remarkably interesting. Uh, speak to you soon. Uh, please go away this morning. Thanks, Adam. Thank you. So, so moving to the, the next segment of the seminar, as I said, um, you know, we were, uh, the next segment is on the future of work. Um, we've talked about the challenges with the current work, uh, remote working, etc. Now, future of work, of course, what the pandemic has taught us is remote working is, is possible and is possible in most roles. Many of our clients are considering a permanent remote model. If not, of course, hybrid is something that's definitely being considered. Um, and when we talk about the future, as I said, uh, we have to touch upon the labor codes. I know a lot of you have already typed in question on the labor codes. And I think the most important is, is the effective date. Um, but we that's those are some of the issues we intend to touch upon. And for that, joining me today is Aditya Prakash. Aditya is a lead employment counsel at Google India. And prior to joining Adit, uh, Google, Aditya was, um, and I would say continues to be an integral part of the trilegal employment team. So he was a lawyer with us. Um, and in his current role as uh, the lead employment counsel for Google, he advises on all employment legal operations and uh, in matters for, for Google. So um, thank you for joining us, Aditya. Thank you so much for having me, Swarma, and thanks for that kind introduction. Um, I think that first session was very interesting. I think we all could have done with another 30 minutes of that <laughs> conversation between you, <laughs> Shreya and Nidhi, but uh, yeah, that was great. Thank you. Um, thanks. So I think the first question, Aditya, and this is something you must be asked a lot is um, because Google is always looked as as the trendsetter in the industry, right? So what is your current working model? Are you looking at hybrid? Is remote working or fully remote something which is there on the card, something that you all have been discussing? Yeah, thanks for that, Swarma. Yes, uh, very frequently asked question and uh, you know, I'm sure you've seen a lot of the reports on that, that as well. So, you know, I think as a starting point, as a company, you know, I think Google believes deeply in the value of uh, interpersonal interaction at the office. I think our leadership has communicated that before as well. Um, obviously, you know, and, and also as part of, you know, internal surveys, hearing from employees, what we've heard is something that over the past two years, employees have missed out a lot on is those very interactions at the office. Uh, you know, it's not just the interactions amongst employees, but just the interaction with the workplace itself. Uh, you know, the the with the Google Office, it is a certain type of experience that everybody does look forward to in the organization. Um, so, you know, just taking all that into account, at least our our I, I think our primary philosophy is, you know, being at the workplace, interacting with each other, uh, sort of drives innovation. You know, helps with all that that creativity. Now, all that said, obviously, I think we can all agree at least in this forum, we can all agree that, you know, there comes a certain flexibility um, with, you know, being able to work from home. We've all experienced it and we do like a large part of it. And, and, and so really, I, I think where we finally landed on is trying to balance between these two, because we do have, you know, a large part of our workforce wanting to come back, have that opportunity, but equally also wanting to have that flexibility. So, so our current working model is, a majority of um, our employees, as we call Googlers, um, have the ability to work from home for two days in a week. And for the other three days of the week, they do have to come in. Uh, and so it's a hybrid working model. Obviously, that, that applies mostly across the board, but you know, you could have, and I think Nidhi and Shreya covered there as well, you could have certain roles where it's not possible to perform uh, the role from home and therefore people are required to come in. You know, that could be either because um, handling certain types of data or people working at data centers and, and things like that. So I think that's that's definitely been, been our model for now. Um, that aside, fully remote working, again, is not something that's been entirely ruled out. We do allow for it. Uh, of course, depends on various factors, depends on the role. Uh, I think as a starting point, it depends on the product area or what, you know, what we call product area, or you could say um, in general parlance is the business vertical, uh, the, the leadership and that vertical being okay with that sort of a model where someone can work remotely. So there is that opportunity, people can apply for it. Obviously it goes through a vetting process. 
you know, the manager needs to approve, like Shreya Nidhi also said, happens in their organizations. We also have a legal and an HR sort of vetting stage, you know, to ensure that we have all our compliances in place for, for enabling someone to work out of that location. And, and then, so, so I think overall, we do expect that, you know, around 20% of the workforce globally might be working remotely at some point of time. So yes, that's definitely there. But I think as a general model, hybrid is what, what we do have. Uh, you know, just broadly beyond that, if I can take another minute and explain, you know, I think I think beyond that, we also have a model where we allow employees to work for four weeks in a year from anywhere. So you can work remotely from anywhere for four weeks in a year. Mm. Um, and I think ultimately, at least what I've realized over the last two years as we've worked on a lot of these policies is, you know, just trying to understand where people are coming from, looking at your own experience as well, right? So even with return to office, we do have, and we did have for our offices a specific date within which people needed to come back. But, you know, it isn't a hard, hard sort of uh, hard stop, you know, um, there could be reasons someone's a caregiver and they need an additional period of time. So we've had cases where you, someone's got a four, eight, 12 week extension in order for them to be able to return to work. And I think the last piece is also, you know, I think like Nidhi mentioned as well, you know, cities hired, uh, three times that you know their of their workforce over the last two years we've had that same sort of hiring trajectory and so it's also recognizing that you have this significant population that's never had a chance to meet their colleagues never had a chance to actually visit the office and they've been working remotely right from the start uh, and you know i think that we do see value in giving them that experience because that is a huge part of the the experience of working at Google, you know, being able to go into the office. So I, I think all, all of those considerations have played a role in the, the hybrid model. Um, obviously, I think, and you know, this is probably a question I'd, I'd like to pose to you is, uh, you know, obviously with the fully remote working model where companies are considering, I think one of the big questions on everybody's mind is how do you manage compliances, right? Uh, at least as, as compliance, uh, you know, people and employment lawyers, we understand there's your professional tax, which is state specific. You have your leaves and holidays, which are state specific. And there are, I know, you know, case laws, obviously you're, you're the expert on that. There are case laws on, you know, how, how what applies where, but how, how do you see that playing out as companies start to go fully remote if they make that a call? Thanks, thanks, Aditya. And yeah, and you know, you've you've really hit the nail on his head because that's that's the question everyone has been asking. Now, uh, yes, fully remote is sounds really good. Sounds and you know, keep the HR aspects aside, even from a legal perspective. Now, India being a federal country with both state and central laws, um, the question that often comes up, say, if I have my office in Bangalore and I'm allowing my employee to work from Hyderabad, do I now start to comply with the laws in Hyderabad? Um, and, and there have been cases where courts have said yes, uh, because it's the place of work of the employee and not really where the office is. Now that, as you can imagine, throws up multiple challenges because if you allow in all, all the states in the country just administratively keeping a track of leaves, holidays, and contributions is, is next to impossible. Now, I've seen companies take different approaches on this. And, and you know, there is the first category who are taking a conscious risk-based call um, and saying that, listen, we need talent and uh, we will allow people to work from anywhere. Um, and we will just apply the laws of the office location. Now that's, that's one approach. Um, and, and then the second approach are, are organizations who are saying that we want to take a, a not a very conservative approach, but also a middle ground, right? So what we will do is identify those five, six locations where we know we'll get talent, uh, do an analysis of that and map out our policies, our benefits, so that our leave policy matches the requirements in those five locations, our holidays are aligned, et cetera, right? Um, that's the second approach, uh, which is the middle ground. And, and the third approach is, which is again, something that is, I would say more common with, with the larger MNC clients that I'm seeing is continuing to say hybrid working model. So you have to be in the base location. Um, you can come to office for two days a week or three days a week, um, but by that you ensure that they are working out of the same state. 
um, and therefore you're not triggering uh, laws of other state. Now, well, this is a very, you know, broad brush on the approaches companies are adopting. You know, we did bring out a discussion paper along with NASCOM to um, and suggesting some of the policy changes to the government to address this issue, possibly suggesting a, a telecommuting law could be a good solution to some of these state specific challenges. And when we did our research, then we saw that in US, for example, they have a very similar challenge as ours. There were case laws which brought out the distinction between employee requesting for a remote working versus employer requiring a remote working. So is the company telling you, you go work in Hyderabad or the employee is saying, please allow me to work from my home. And, and the company need not even know where they are working, right? And we were hoping that there would be case laws in India which, which clarify this. Now, thankfully, last year in November, there was a Kerala High Court ruling which adopted this similar principle. And they said that when it is at the convenience of the employee, then the laws of the office location should continue to apply. Um, so that was a very, I think, a positive ruling for the employer. Now, what is the convenience of employees becomes a very um, question, which is, you know, you can stretch it because many organizations today are coming to us because it's also a business need. They are realizing that, you cannot get talent only in Chennai where your office is, say, for example, and you want to have people in, in uh, Bangalore or, or in, other, in Gurgaon and you want to hire from them. So it's a mix of a business reason versus a convenience. So that becomes a far more nuanced uh, assessment. But one approach I'm seeing organizations adopt is, you know, and more of a practical approach is, put the location as your office location and the employee's request for the work so that you, you position is as an employee's convenience rather than a business requirement. You know, so-, yeah, no, so that, hmm. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was saying, no, that's a great point. Yeah, so I, think, I think that makes sense as well because if, if the primary argument is around convenience, whose convenience it is, I think at okay. least kept, and I think we can agree that if it is genuinely at the employee's request, the only way to capture that is to actually put that in the contract. Uh, so yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. And and I think one question that I have for you, and I'm seeing that, and and I read some news reports about Google as well. And question comes: so when you're have allowing people to work from remote locations, can I go ahead and have different salaries for them, right? And uh, we see in the US, we've seen some companies do it. Uh, just the argument being cost of living in Bangalore versus cost of living in, in a tier two city is very different. So can I reduce some of the, the allowances? So just in terms of, uh, you know, you, you mentioned you don't have many remote working employees, but there are there thoughts around having a differential pay, um, both in India, outside, um, and as an employment lawyer, what, what are your thoughts around, can that be done? Yeah, great question. Thanks, Vanma. So I think uh, in the US, we do have, uh, you know, we do have that. Uh, it, it's been implemented where depending on the location, the pay does. Uh, obviously, it's an evolving subject for now, at least in India, there isn't, that is not something that's being, um, you know, uh, considered. I think more generally on the question of can an employer have differential uh, pay depending on where someone's working or, you know, if, if your company's moving to remote working, can they then decide to have differential pay? My my view as an employment lawyer in general would be that it's possible. Obviously, you know, it's it's something that you have to agree to under, under contract and, um, you know, you have to keep certain things in consideration. For instance, you know, your minimum wages, depending on the organization, minimum wages does become a relevant factor uh, under the provident fund law there is there is that requirement around not reducing wages in order to reduce your pf contribution again i think a lot of that can be addressed through the contract they're not you know red flags flag issues as such uh, so i would say yes it, it is possible obviously from a legal perspective from an hr optics perspective whether companies would choose to do that or not obviously is a you know company specific question but it's not something that's being considered at the moment um, right. at google for india yeah but you did mention that it's it's something that's been considered in, in the US. Yes, it is something that's been done in the US, yes. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah and that's been my experience as well, you know, that 
uh, in India, it's just been at the discussion stage. But like you rightly said, it's it's a matter of contract. So it's something that can be done. Um, but there are multiple things to really think about. Okay, and I think when we're talking about future of work, right, um, uh, we have to talk about the gig workers and freelancers because that's something we've been reading about a lot. And generally, I think in, in the last few years, individuals have, have valued most as flexibility. And I think I see more and more people uh, want versus, you know, the, there's a shift between from the job security and wanting a job security to flexibility. And you are, people are getting better talent uh, in that engagement. For companies, it has a beneficial approach um, because you know, um, obviously there's more flexibility when you're engaging gig workers, right? Um, the labor codes also do now include provisions on, on gig workers um, and has some benefits. So, what are your thoughts on this? Is, is gig worker, freelancers, is something that being considered something that is the future of, of employment really? And, and again, I will always ask you questions as an employment lawyer, where do you see that play out with the codes? Yeah, no, thanks for that, Sonma. I think, you know, I think you're right. Uh, we've definitely seen a lot of discussion around it. I think within India itself, and of course, globally as well, with the pandemic, um, you know, and, and if we're talking classic definition of gig workers, we've seen, you know, delivery personnel, there's been an increasing need for it. Lots of companies in that space, um, you know, having increasing need for, for that classification of workers. So I, I definitely think it's a growing area. Uh, like you said, you know, obviously it depends on the nature of the role as well. I, the way I look at gig workers, you know, I think over the past few years, gig workers has maybe been pigeonholed into a very specific type of worker, you know, someone working in an aggregator type model. But I don't think it's necessarily that. Uh, I mean, uh, to me, a gig worker falls under the larger subset of an independent contractor, right? Because effectively, it's the same type of an arrangement. Uh, I think, you know, as far as whether there will be more discussion on this, I definitely think so. More legislation, like you said, you know, the, the, the labor codes do talk about a social security scheme. In fact, I think I read very recently that I think in July, the EPFO is actually meeting to put together a scheme, um, you know, under the codes for gig worker social security. So I, you know, I don't think it's long before we'll see a draft scheme, at least out which talks about what companies need to do for gig workers. And one of the key things there that'll be interesting to understand is one, how is the government looking at or how, is the, how are the government departments looking at what a gig worker means, right? Uh, because if you look at the codes, it's used in the context of aggregators, but is it only aggregator related gig workers? Is it anybody who does the same type of work? And, and you know, in general, otherwise also, I think, um, you know, like there's been a recent, um, there's a Supreme Court judge who recently, in fact, made a statement saying there needs to be more labor law coverage for gig workers because they're not covered. So I definitely think it's a space to look out for. Uh, obviously, it's more relevant for companies that will have roles, you know, in that, in, in the, in that space, space. But uh, yeah, there's going to be a lot, I, I, I suspect. I mean, in the same context, though, I think um, the other thing that the codes, you know, cover is... Is the whole contract labor arrangement and you know we've obviously had the clra for the longest time and it's had you know not necessarily gone through too many amendments but at least my reading of it has been that there there seems to be some changes um you know on, in the scope just in terms of you know who a contract worker is what the coverage is and things like that so i you know just wondering if you had any thoughts on that sure yeah i would say you know the one of the top issues under the labor court to look out for would be contract workers. I would, I think if, if I were to rate the issues under the labor court, to me, the first is wages, which of course everyone is talking about and the impact that this has. Um, but contract worker comes a close second in, in that priority. Um, I think it's, it's going to change quite a bit after the courts come into force. Um, and, and it can be broadly the, the good and the bad. I think the good news for um, many of our clients is that the scope of who is contract worker is reducing. Now, under the current Contract Labor Act, 
there is no distinction between services contract or manpower contract. So, um, you know, whether it's Google providing a service to another company uh, and, you know, highly qualified tech engineers performing that role, or whether it is an organization supplying security guard or housekeeping, all of them fall within the purview of Contract Labor Act uh, under the current uh, 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 law, provided, of course, you're working from the client's premises. And therefore, there is a requirement to get a registration and a license. Uh, what And there was constantly, I mean, over the years, there has always been a pushback from the industry saying that the scope should be limited. It should not cover white collar employees. It should only cover, um, you know, where manpower employees, right? Um, the court has tried to address this to some extent. And, and what it has done is the definition of contract labor is now much narrower. So if someone is providing their regular employees, so people who are already on the payrolls of, say, Infosys, Wipro, Google, um, and they are they are into a service agreement with a client, they have sent their employees to perform that work, that would not fall within the definition of contract labor, right? Uh, what would fall within the definition of contract labor is if the company goes to a manpower agency and says, I want these qualifications, Will you recruit someone and deploy them to my premises? That's what would be covered. So that's now, I would say, when we worked with clients on this evaluation and, and brings down the scope of who falls within contract labor by about 20, 30%, right? So there is a much smaller group of people to whom this law will apply once the code comes into force. The second positive change has been the threshold has increased. Now, under the current law, it's 20. So 20 or more in your premises. And many states have amended it. It's 50 in many locations. Uh, with the courts, it's becoming 50. So 50 or more in the premises, that's where the law and the requirements would trigger. I think the bad news is the that engagement of contract labor will be prohibited in core activity. And that's where it's becoming far more, you know, people are having concerns because um, we know how, how common it is to have agency workers, contract workers in, in your offices. So what really is core activity? I mean, essentially anything for which your entity is set up and, and anything which is perennial, anything which is routine. So for a tech company, of course, your software engineers, um, technology folks, but also HR, recruitment, tax, finance, because all of them are integral functions to running the company, right? So as a blanket, uh, engagement of contract labors would be prohibited in core activities. Now, in India, currently, there is a similar prohibition in Telangana and Andhra Pradesh. Um, so we'll see how that pans out once the code comes into, comes into effect. There are a few exceptions, of course, um, where it's a general practice in the industry to engage contract workers or uh, where there is a specific requirement. For example, an employee has gone on maternity leave and I want to find a, temp a replacement for a temporary period. Or suddenly there is a new client project, which is for a short term, which needs me to have a higher bench strength, right? But I don't see that project being long term there I could engage contract workers. So there are exceptions to this, but there is a much narrower scope to engage them in core activity, right? Uh, now, given this, what, what I would suggest organizations to do is uh, start looking at your contracts more carefully. Start looking at your contracts, identifying where it is uh, contract labor and where not. And when I've done this assessment for quite a few of our clients, um, we looked through like 200, 300 contracts, and we then could take out about 150 of them outside the scope of contract labor itself, just by restructuring the way the contracts were worded and the arrangement was worded. So that's that's the first approach to do this, right? And, and second, with the remaining, then we need to sit down with the business team, work with them and understand the requirements and see how we can make them uh, fall within one of these exemptions. So I think it's a very close work with the legal team, employment, law, employment lawyers like you and me working with our business payroll teams and then looking at solutions to, to see how, how that can work. 
Thanks, Anma. Yeah, that's a yeah really interesting take on the codes. I think we'll just have to wait and see how the authorities interpret it as well, and you know maybe take it from there. And and talking about the codes, I think I, we can't ignore the newspaper articles which say it will become effective first July. Um, I mean, just for the audience here, from my discussions with the authorities, people in the department. Uh, Everyone has said even they are not aware of this date. So, so uh, we don't know if it's a it's a real credible date that we can rely on. Uh, at least there's no official uh, announcement yet. And uh, right, uh, but I think uh, and I would like to hear if if you've had different uh, uh, you know heard something differently on that, Aditya. But the other thing I'm, I've been reading in the uh, newspaper reports are that. With the labor codes, you can now uh, have a four-day week um, and you can change the working arrangement. So, and this four-day week has been something that's been, you know, constantly coming up. People have been talking about it as, as one of the new ways of working. Now, is this something that, that Google is considering? Are you all considering reducing from a five-day working model to a three-day or a four-day working model? Sure. Thanks, Anma. So I think on the first point, the codes itself, I, I mean, I think we can all agree we'd all like a little bit of a heads up uh, before the codes get rolled out. My, I mean, just going on precedent or at least general precedent, I would, you know, I imagine that all the states should be rolling out their uh, state specific rules. Um, and that's not happened yet. I mean, I think there are a handful of states that need to still come out with their rules. So I would imagine it's only after that, that the codes come in. But you know, we ne we never know. Uh, obviously, I don't. I don't think we've. I think we've seen a few news reports. I mm -hmm. don't think we've seen any. You know, uh, government officials or ministers actually issue a press release to that effect. So, yeah, I think we're all just waiting to see. But uh, hopefully, there's a little bit of a heads up. Obviously, given all the things we need to ensure are in place. On the four-day we work week, I think that's not something that uh, you know or what what's being popularly called the compressed work week it's not something that we're considering at the moment certainly i mean you know obviously we've just moved into the hybrid work week that's working well but obviously people are still transitioning into it so i think the focus is really there um so we're not really looking at the four day work week at the at the moment um i guess my question would be you know and i've been curious about this it's fine on the one hand to say four day work week but how does that play out because you know, if 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 someone's going to be made to work 12 hours a day in order to make it a four-day work week, uh, that could be breaching your daily working hours, for instance, your spread over limits. Overtime could be applicable on a daily basis. So how how do you view that? Is that even legal? And you know, what are the challenges with something like that? Yeah, that's that's exactly my thought on it. I mean, I don't see this requirement on daily and weekly limits changing with the code. Yes the codes now also have provisions. So now we have a central law which will have provisions on daily and weekly hours, but that does not mean that it overrides the state law. And that's the beauty of our federal structure and, and keeps us lawyers busy is, is uh, the ambiguity in between the state and central laws, the conflict. And, and the way the courts have looked at it is that both have to be read together. Both have to be read harmoniously. Uh, so the daily limits under the state laws will continue to apply. So in some states, for example, in Telangana, IT companies have an exemption from the daily limit. So as long as they comply with the weekly 48 hours, the requirement and the trigger for overtime does not arise. So there, there is more flexibility. You can have a 10-day or a 12-hour working schedule for four days a week that you could do that. Um, but in other states like Karnataka, Maharashtra, and most other locations where your daily limits apply, uh, if you are considering a four-day limit, you are legally triggering the obligation to, to pay overtime, right? So it's, it's not something um, that, uh, to my mind, is changing with the labor court. So the position really continues to, to remain the same. Yeah, and I, I think, uh, yeah, some of the reports on multiple issues under the labor code sometimes, you know, tend to read that way. Uh, but obviously, it's more an option versus, you know, is it mandatory sort of a thing also. But yeah, that's that's useful. Thanks, Varma. 
and and you know to my mind i think that's where the the if we look at future of work and we look at how organizations are evolving with remote working we want india to be a, a place where uh, we can see generate employment generating i mean i firmly believe that the last two years has really taught us that you can work remotely um it it also i mean just otherwise walking on the roads of or driving in the roads of bangalore has been better uh in, when there is you know lesser congestion yeah. on roads so i think there are lots of benefits to it both from a civic infrastructure perspective to to employees flexibility to so it's beneficial for the government beneficial for individuals beneficial for organizations um and to me the biggest roadblock that we see is the state and central laws and i think one of the solutions would be like we've discussed and we've discussed various approach solutions in our discussion paper but coming out with a telecommuting law um, or a law on on uh, work from home and we are seeing many countries do that and and follow that approach right so i yeah. would i think more from a futuristic wish list uh, kind of thing and and we are working towards that with with various government representatives but i think that would be something where we should see a uh, labor and employment law go um and how we we should see it evolve yeah absolutely agree and i think just uh, uh, and i'm going through the questions here that we got from some some people at the end and there was one question about where you mentioned people can work for the four weeks anywhere right um could is it only limited to india or is it also overseas location and and i can understand where that question is coming from because i'm also receiving a a lot of these questions where people want to um their family is outside india or their spouse is outside india and they want to go and work outside india for for some time and then come back is that something that is being considered have you been receiving such requests and how have you all been dealing with them uh yeah so i think have we been receiving such requests a bit early because you know these are more recent sort of policies the 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 intent is of course that you would be able to allow be allowed to work from anywhere uh, across the globe obviously like any of the other part, you know parts of our working model there are certain checks obviously that need to go through as we know you know there there could be implications from a you know a labor law perspective or tax implication there could be various aspects that need to be considered but that at least is the you know the intent behind uh, having this work from anywhere so it is you know remotely across the globe thanks thanks for that and and you're absolutely right i mean working four weeks from india is is an easier approach because the tax considerations are not there but when it is anywhere across the globe then you are also not only looking at indian laws you are say if you have an employee working in the us and you are allowing them you want to see that it's not creating a permanent establishment risk for your company there or not triggering any employment benefits so to my mind i i would say any such request should be closely evaluated i have seen companies come out with saying that up to 10 days can be allowed and and there's no i mean there's no golden formula to arrive at it because this assessment has to be done from each country perspective um, but just to give you a sense of what what we're seeing in in the industry so thank you so much for for your time here aditya and and sharing some very very interesting um you know insights about what what you're looking at what the future holds and and where google is thinking so thank you thank you for the discussions thank you so much thank you absolutely thanks a lot anita um so many more than if you uh, want to take a few more questions uh there are so many uh including some in the chat <laughs> uh so i don't know if you uh, want to take a few now sure i'll i'll be happy to take a few wonderful questions. okay yeah yeah we uh, have like six six more minutes or so uh, so please go ahead yeah um let me see i think we did address the four weeks from anywhere any impact of the upcoming new labor code on the hybrid work arrangements um I don't think so because there are two provisions in the code which kind of talk about remote working. 
Uh, one is under the model standing orders for service industries, which says employees and employee can work to a, on a hybrid working arrangement. The second is in the maternity benefit provisions, which say when you're providing crash benefits, it should also be available to employees who are working remotely from home. Now, my reading, of course, of this is, is that uh, uh, the expectation of the law is not that you have a crash outside each employee's home, because that's just impossible, but more that the benefits should be available to all employees, whether they are working in office or, or from home. So to answer the question, no, nothing really changes with the courts on with respect to hybrid work arrangements. It's something that is can be considered something that organizations have been actively coming up with. And as we discussed with, you know, Shreya and Nidhi in the earlier part of the session and Aditya later, many companies are coming up with their policies on how they want to deal with this hybrid working approach. Okay. Um, it is tricky because there are questions in the chat and questions yes. in the Q&A box. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So there's a question from Jed Dev on um, if employee is cannot be vaccinated and the role mandates work from office, how do we deal with it? I think that's that's a very good question, Jed Dev. Um, it's a difficult answer. Um, <laughs> I would say, see, you cannot, uh, then you would have to come up with accommodation if it's a role that can only and only be performed from office. Uh, because you cannot terminate the employment on ground of the fact that the person has refused to get vaccinated. Because ultimately, the way courts have looked at it, it's an individual's right um, to, to determine uh, what medical treatment they want to undergo, for instance, right? Um, so, so what I would suggest is you could consider regular testing. Um, and testing is, again, a reliable uh, manner. I've seen organizations have a weekly testing for people who are not vaccinated and who have to come to office. Uh, just implement that to ensure things are taken care of from a health and safety perspective. Maybe one more question? Yes. Um... I'm, I'm going through them at the same time as well. Yeah. <clears throat> uh. Okay. So, so there's one where, you know, um, the concern is that when employees don't move back, uh, having shifted to their hometown, do we see similar concerns coming to HR? And how have we responded to those when the reasons are related to cost of living and financial aspects? Now, um, I mean, just from a legal perspective, I would say that, uh, see, our employment contracts does have a provision on, on place of work. And therefore, as an organization, we do have a right to require employees to come back to work. Uh, when there were orders on work from home and mandatory work from home, yes, there, there were limitations. But now with those orders lifted, uh, from a legal perspective, we do have that right as organizations. The question becomes more of an HR um, and an approach to employees. I think, you know, I've been reading articles, the concerns being resignation or, you know, having employees leave and how do we manage that? And I think my takeaway from discussions with Shreya and Nidhi have been just the communication um, explaining to them uh, that the requirement is to come back to office. That's the company policy. Uh, understanding, I mean, financial aspects are something that they agreed right in the beginning. So the employment contract was on the understanding that they'll work from the office. The salary was agreed on that understanding. So just because of COVID, I don't think that changes. Um, maybe we could consider giving them more time, but ultimately the requirement is for them to come back to office. And that has to be managed uh, by way of employee, individual employee communications. Great, wonderful. Um, I think we're coming to an end, so Nima. Uh, there's so many questions, sorry about that. Uh, I mean, it's great, it's very good, we're sorry to the year. Uh, 
audience if we can air and to address all of them um i am going to have to wrap it up uh so i just want to say you know just want to thank you i'm just sharing the screen now um where we can see your photo and your uh, email address so thank you so much for uh, for the session that was very useful i thought a uh, huge thank you to try legal and to you, uh, Swani, Matt, Nidhi, Shreya, and Aditya, who uh, uh, spoke at, uh, in the panel. Thank you to the audience as well. If you have any uh, further questions, I encourage you to contact Rally Gunan, or specifically uh, Swani, of course. You can see her email address and uh, her photo on your screen. So that's Swani, Matt, Rally And um, I hope to uh, see you, or we hope to see you at another uh, webinar shortly. Thank you very much.